So a little context to this gospel. We have, uh, it's just after Jesus has washed his disciples' feet. You remember that from Holy Thursday. And then uh, Judas, Jesus says to Judas, do what you have to do and do it quickly. And so he goes out and John says, and it was night. And then from there, what happens? The immediate thing that Jesus says is, now is the Son of Man glorified. He's about to start his passion. And he's saying, he's about to suffer so incredibly deeply in all manners of his personhood. And this is what he calls glory? And yet, and yet, the suffering and cross that he endures is only the beginning. It's a sign of what's going to happen afterwards with the resurrection, the ascension, drawing us into the very heart of Almighty God. So we can look at this on the other side and say, yes, this is the beginning of His glory. And what is His glory? His glory is revealed not in His power, phenomenal cosmic powers, but rather in His humble love. His reaching out in love to us. You see, the cross would be worthless without that divine love coming from the heart of Christ. We know that hundreds, even thousands of Jews were crucified by the Romans, especially in 70 AD as they were uh, uh, siege, besieging Jerusalem. They had so many cru crosses and crucifixions during that time that they ran out of trees that they were cutting down. They had to actually go out further and they, they didn't have enough trees for the crucifixions. So crucifixion itself is not saving. It's not glorifying. But it's the divine love that Jesus pours out. And then Jesus says to us, I give you a new commandment. Okay, thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not commit adultery. We've got all these commandments from, from uh, the Decalogue where, G where Almighty God gives it to Moses and to the people of Israel. So I bet they're saying, okay, what is this new commandment going to be? What shalt we not do? But it's not a thou shalt not. Love one another. I could see Peter just falling off his seat at that moment. What? That wasn't what I was expecting. John going, huh. And you're saying, I gotta love him? <laughs> love one another. And then he puts this twist on it. As I have loved you, so you, al so you also should love one another. As I have loved you. This is just after he's washed the feet, right? And then he's saying, I'm going to my glory. As I have loved you, so also you must love one another. Yesterday, uh, my cousin's son got married. It was a beautiful day. And as we had three priests there, as one of the priests said in the sacristy after that, after the wedding, he said, well, that was more Catholic than, than some, Catholic than some of the ordinations I've been to. <laughs> My cousin's son is really into the faith. But so, you look at them and the way they're Google eyes at each other the whole day, and the kisses, and all that, well, you know, the clinking of the glasses, and all that stuff that goes on. That's easy to love, right? When, oh yes, I love you so much, I love you so much. Then there come times when it's not so easy, right? Any of you who are married, you know this. Love isn't always easy. I was listening to um, a, a video that was uh, done by Dr. Uh, Ted Shree and his wife Beth, and they were talking a little bit about marriage and stuff like that, and it, it struck me as, as I was listening, I said, this would be good for my homily. So, but I'll give credit when credit where credit is due. So they were talking about Jesus inviting us to love in those moments of frustration. And they shared the story of a couple friends that were getting married, 
and when they went to, she went to his house to kind of help pack him up and move the stuff over to their new house that they were going to be having. And she's noticing, or he, she, yeah, she's noticing as she's packing up, there are socks everywhere. She's like, well, there's socks behind this bookcase. Okay, there's socks over here. And this is, it's like, and as she's doing this, the longer she's doing it, the more she's thinking, this is going to be my life. Socks everywhere. And so, you know, she was right. After they got married, as she's walking around the house, she'd be sock here, sock there. Well, she decided to do a, uh, an experiment one time. She saw a sock on the stair. And she said, well, I'm not going to pick it up. I want to see how long it stays there. And her husband would be going up and says, oh, I got to get that sock. He'd say these things over and over again. And he'd always forget to come back and get the sock. Finally, he came to realize, she knows. <laughs> and she's testing me. But she didn't rail on him. She didn't wag her finger. But it did give them an, an opportunity to talk and have that conversation. But so there are times which can be very frustrating. But, but, Dr. Sri said to this woman, she said, that sock is a tabernacle. What? That sock is a tabernacle. You remember the tabernacle right over here where we keep the very presence of Almighty God? That sock is a tabernacle. Why? Because it's an opportunity to encounter Jesus. To show love in that moment. In that moment of frustration. Because that's where real love comes about, right? Not in those moments of, oh, I do, I do, now we're married, oh, it's so wonderful. But in the struggles, in the downtimes, in the crosses, that's where love shows its real potency. In the trying times, those moments when you're doing everything you can to keep your mouth shut, because you know if you open your mouth, you're going to have to go to confession. It's those moments that are such a struggle where we learn to love. Dr. Sri and his wife shared another story, which they call the can story. And it, they were talking about assuming positive intent. Assuming that this is the right intention for someone. They, in, they really mean it right. You know, and they shared, you know, remember when you got those pictures back when we used to develop pictures? You probably don't know what we're talking about. Um, when we used to have to develop pictures and you didn't know what you were going to get when you took a photo. You couldn't just look at the back and say, well, I'll delete that one. Let's start over again. And when you got them back, some of the pictures didn't always come out good. And you look and say, you get a picture of someone who's like, well, that wasn't the best shot of them, but that's not who they really are. It's not who they really are. So we assume that positive intent. So they tell this can story where they're putting these cans away after shopping and Dr. Sri said something along the lines about the budget or something like that. And there was a certain tonality in it. And as, you know, it's one of those things that you wish you could go fishing after it's come out of your mouth. You're like, G -g -g -g, bring it back, bring it back. That shouldn't have come out. Uh, uh, uh. Uh, and... He's like, well, I'm just going to keep going and hope she didn't pick up on that tone of voice. When the can hit the counter, he's like, nope, she picked up on it. But she said to him, you didn't mean that, did you? She could have railed him out. She could have given him a hard time, could have insulted him or shamed him, but she gave him an opportunity to start over. Assuming 
This isn't the best picture of him. This isn't who he really is. You didn't really mean that, did you? No, no, I definitely didn't mean that. And starting over. An opportunity to apologize and to forgive. You see, if we're going to love as Jesus loves, whether that's in marriage or friendship or in any other circumstance, if we're to love as Jesus has loved us, we got to do what he did, right? And he said, Father, forgive them. They do not know what they're doing. It's an invitation to forgiveness. It's an invitation for those three words. I am sorry. And then the other three words. I forgive you. When we look at the way things are done in our social media today, there is no I'm sorry. There is no I forgive you. It's bully, 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 bully. When we look at our politics, it's bully, 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 bully. I remember several years ago, a young man speaking to me and saying, you know, I can't stand the haters. And I'm saying, well, <laughs> do you see the logical inconsistency here? You're hating the haters. So that means you're a hater. So you hate yourself. Says, oh, no, no, I only hate those who hate others. <laughs> and I said, you know, if you're going to be Catholic, it means loving your enemies. Not hating the haters, but reaching out an olive branch. Loving those who you see as haters. However, he defined that in his mind. And this is hard. In those moments of frustration, in those moments of persecution, in those moments of anger, in those moments when everything goes wrong, in the moments when you just are sick of picking up his socks. These are the moments where real love can shine forth. As I have loved you, so you also should love one another. This is how all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Not if you like the rest of the world, which gives you two strikes and then you're out. I know that's a bad baseball analogy, sorry. But we're called to forgive and to love and to love and to forgive because that's what he does.